Because Awake is committed to listening to and learning from those who have experienced abuse in the Catholic Church, we make the deliberate choice to devote our first conversation of each season to the wisdom of those people, those who have experienced abuse. Today, we look closely at what it's like for abuse survivors to share their story of church abuse with other people, including family members, friends, church officials, or fellow parishioners. Sadly, many victim survivors in the awake community have recounted instances in which these deeply personal disclosures are met with negative, hurtful comments that sometimes cause more trauma than the original abuse. At the same time, some survivors have described beautiful experiences of telling their stories and being met with compassion and empathy that helped heal their wounds. There's so many different types of experiences and we really have a lot to learn from all of them. So today we're honored to hear from three victim survivors. We have Gina Barthel, Vincent Perez, and Wendy Mitch, who will tell us what went well and what didn't when they disclose their abuse. Our hope is that in listening to them, we will all grow in our skills of accompaniment. So let's begin that conversation now. I'll turn to Sarah Larson, Awake's Executive Director, who will serve as our moderator. Thank you so much, Mary. And uh, thank you again to our, our panelists and to everyone for joining us today. So I have the honor of introducing each of our panelists and also asking them our first question. Um, so first we are going to, I'm going to introduce Vince. Um, so Vince Perez grew up in a large traditional Mexican Catholic family on the outskirts of Los Angeles. He attended minor seminary beginning at age 14 where he was abused by a priest who was his mentor and confessor. He is a recently retired psychiatrist, enjoying life in Pasadena, California with his wife and grandchildren. And I had the honor of, of meeting Vince fairly recently, and he has very quickly become a valued member of the Awake community. He has a lot of wisdom to share, and so Vince, we're very grateful to have you here. So Vince, we're going to start with you with our first question before I introduce Gina and Wendy. And just ask you to describe one of the very first times you told someone about the abuse you experienced and maybe what what led you to tell this person at this moment and how did they respond? Well, thank you. Uh, it's a great honor to be here with uh, with all of you. Um, as, as uh, Sarah had mentioned, I entered the minor seminary at age 14 and I uh, was there for four years until I was 17. And uh, the abuse uh, took place on a very regular basis throughout those four years. Um, six years later, um, I met my wife and um, we decided to get married and we asked this priest to marry us. Uh, this priest had been... Um, uh, had grown to be a very big part of my family, my grandparents, my parents, uh, and other members. He oftentimes would show up on vacations or other family events. And so it was just kind of natural in a way to have him uh, officiate. Um, I uh, was still in a lot of denial. I It's not like I had ever forgotten any of the occurrences, uh, but I they were way back in some corner of the back of my mind. And um, I proceeded to move on with, with my life. Um, about, uh, so when I was about 40 years of age, um, I was working, um, had, uh, just arrived home from, uh, a day at the office and hospital and, um, uh, was, uh, starting to unwind. I flipped on the television. Um, I may have had a beer or more likely a glass of wine in my hand at the time to kind of help. And, uh, suddenly I noticed that 
on the evening national news was a screenshot of my perpetrator, his, his face, and, and it was a, a photo of him from one of our albums when I was in the seminary. So it was very familiar, and there was no doubt that this was my perpetrator. And from what I remember, the uh, newscaster was talking about how uh, information was starting to uh, be found that uh, abuse had taken place at this particular seminary for some period of time, and uh, they were starting to do some uh, research and investigation, and uh, that this priest in particular had been uh, uh, very likely involved in the abuse of uh, many, many um, uh, other seminarians. Um, Needless to say, I, I I lost my breath. I I, I was totally shocked uh, to see this and numbed. And during the 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 uh, newscast, I I called over to my wife who was in the next room, and I said, "Hey, come look at this. You you know you're not going to believe this." And and she knew this person because again she had he had married us and we had had a couple of occasions of you know meeting and over the, the ensuing years and so uh, she too was just totally dumbfounded you know, just totally taken by surprise and shock and um, we we got through that and then we looked at each other and and in total disbelief and and. Um, and I, 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 when I remember, I, I believe we we both cried in each other's arms at that time. Uh, and uh, you know, I I was still in in this numb shock. Part of it was probably some disassociation in this part of my my PTSD that I became more aware of uh, that was occurring. And uh, my wife. Uh, very lovingly and very compassionately, you know, was asking, you know, about how I was doing and, 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 uh, and began to ask questions and, and then started to realize the, the gravity of, of what we were starting to, to hear. And, and she started to uh, experience a lot of anger towards this person uh, feeling totally betrayed. Um, she, too, has been a very devout Catholic, very traditional Catholic for years, and this was like totally, you know, unheard of, unexpected, and to be, you know, something that clearly was affecting our relationship, even though we hadn't named it at that point, um, that we could we could begin to see some of the, the 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 tragic severe damage that was occurring and but um that was the first time i told anybody first time i told myself i guess um was being confronted that way and and i was just so so very blessed fortunate to have been at home and to have a, a loving uh caring wife who understood, tried to understand, continued to be a source of tremendous support throughout. Um, and uh, so that's how my first, mm -hmm. my first, uh, you know, uh, uh, talking of my, uh, explaining my story um, uh, went about. Thank you, Vince. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And I'm grateful to know that you're your wife was there with you and supportive in that moment. Um, I'm gonna turn next to our next panelist, uh, Wendy Mitch, and introduce her, and then I'll ask her the same question. Uh, so Wendy Mitch lives in Plover, Wisconsin with her husband, Rusty, and she is an avid hiker, cycler, and pickleballer. She spent 30 years working in Catholic ministry and now works as a life coach. In 2022, she reported for the first time the clergy abuse that she experienced beginning at age 17. 
And Wendy has been a engaged member of the AWAKE community for several years and um, a participant in our retreat the last few years and brings a, a smile and such joy to every space she is in. So I'm really grateful to you for being here, Wendy. And uh, this is Wendy's first time speaking uh, as a survivor in a public space. So we're very grateful for uh, your courage and for trusting us with your sharing today, Wendy. Thank you. Uh, so what would you like to say about one of the first times you told someone about the abuse you experienced? Um, I feel like I have to bring a smile right away. Um and, and this isn't something to smile about, but I feel smiley. And I just want to say too, I am so honored that in the introductions, the special welcome is always given to survivors. And that that's just so unfamiliar to me. Um, so the first time I told anybody was 40 years after the abuse. And um, I told the therapist, I started seeing a therapist in January of 2022. And in May, so five, six months later, I told this therapist. And part of the therapy was for me to write a letter, not to send it, but just to write it to the priest who, who abused me. And so I did. And I kind of have a tendency to go rogue. And so I sent the letter to him. Um, to the priest who lived about 35 miles north of me. And he wrote back and um, acknowledged everything and apologized and how horrible and immature and all the things. And then he asked if he could meet with me. And it was at that point that something shifted in me because before I, I didn't think of reporting. I just wanted to deal with this secret I held for so long. But when he asked to meet with me so he could look me in the eyes and apologize, something shifted. And in talking with my therapist, um, suggested I just contact law firms that specialize in this stuff. And there was a law firm in New York City who said, well, we can't do anything about this because statute of limitations. But in the state of Wisconsin, there's an initiative with the DOJ, the attorney general's office, that they were trying to get all any minor who was ever sexually abused, clergy, religious leaders, any institutional um, abuse to report. I just went online and filled out their their online like it's like an application, basically, but told the whole story there. And then talked to whoever the lady is at the the DOJ who works with victims, and she was phenomenal. Um, I felt heard, I felt believed, I felt held, I trusted them, kind of just got the ball rolling. Um, and it was after that, that I told my husband. Um, and, and that was a painful day because he just cried and cried. And he stayed next to me that whole, it was a Saturday, I remember, um, just stayed next to me that whole day. Um, yeah, it, it makes me a little emotional when I think about that. So it was really a chain of events that that led me to where I am right now that never I never had intended of reporting. But that's hmm. what I've come to. So yeah, thank you so much for sharing that story, Wendy. And um, I'm grateful to hear that you were received with such compassion, both by therapist and by uh, the person at the DOJ and by your husband. Um, that's a beautiful, a beautiful gift at the beginning of this journey for you. So thank you for sharing all of that. I'm now happy to introduce our third panelist, Gina Bartel. And Gina is a hospice nurse who lives outside of the Twin Cities in Minnesota. She experienced spiritual, emotional, and sexual abuse by a priest who she met when she was a novice in a convent. She has spoken publicly about her story in many forums in the hopes of helping fellow survivors and bringing about transformation in the Catholic Church. And I had the privilege of meeting Gina several years back and um, sharing some of, hearing some of her story at that time. And um, I've just been so impressed with her 
her grace and compassion in the midst of all of this. And I'm really honored, Gina, that you agreed to speak here with us today and um, tell some of your story. So I'd love to start with uh, that same question. Can you tell us about one of the first times that you told someone about the abuse you experienced? Oh, you're on mute, Gina. Absolutely. And um, thank you, Sarah, for having me into the AWAKE community. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to share. So thank you. Um, so the all I would like to share the very first time that I uh, shared with someone uh, was in the midst of the abuse. So I had met this priest in 2004. I ended up discerning out of religious life in 2006. And in 2000, uh, my relationship continued after I left the convent. And in by 2007, um, I was I had so much confusion and chaos in my brain trying to figure out, you know, he was filling my head with all these lies and I was asking all the right questions. Are you sure this is okay? Are you sure that God wants this? You know, uh, it was conflicting obviously with my moral compass. I was asking all the right questions, but I was asking the wrong person because he just continued to lie to me. And so finally I had reached sort of my breaking point and I knew I needed to ask someone outside of him. And so, um, being single, um, I reached out to a priest who I had known for many, many years. And he was actually the first person that I ever told that I had been abused as a child. And he, uh, handled that with such grace that I knew I could go to him. And so I knew two things were true. Well, three things. I knew he was a safe person because of my experiences with him. But ultimately what I knew was that he was going to tell me the truth and he would love me no matter what. And that was super important to me because I was so terrified. And I'll never forget showing up at the rectory. He opened the door and I was so full of anxiety. I just fell into a puddle and I could feel my legs giving out underneath me. And he, he literally grabbed me. Um, and he, he just embraced me. And he, he said to me, Gina, whatever it is, we're going to make it right. Whatever it is, we're going to make it right. And I'll never forget that moment of like, he's, he's here to help me. He doesn't even know what's going on, but he's going to help me. Um, and then sharing, you know, what was happening and being just so terrified, like, what is he going to think of me? What all of that was all of that coming into the light and him being very direct and very clear, this is very wrong and it needs to stop. And then he immediate and, and truthfully, and I know there's lots of survivors who, who watch this. And so, um, I know my experience is not isolated. Um, I just remember crying my eyes out and saying, if you tell a solitary soul what I told you, I will kill myself. I, I, th if this gets out to anyone, I will kill myself. And the next day he called and said, you know, if, if I don't report this to the diocese, who am I as a person? Like I, I, we need to report this and we need to report it to his religious community. He was a religious priest. Um, and so he asked my permission. He didn't do it behind my back. Like he asked my permission, went to the diocese, called his community and then helped me kind of along that journey. Um, but he received me with tremendous amount of, of love, uh, and gentleness. And I'm forever grateful for that. Thank you, Gina. I'm so glad that you had a trusted friend, um, priest to go to and that he received you so well with such love. It really sounds like, you know, from all of you that you received a supportive response to these first disclosures you made, whoever they were to, and what a gift that is. I also know from our conversation earlier this week that not all of the responses that you have received have been so supportive. And so 
I'm going to ask you now to share a little bit about a reaction to your story that was more harmful than helpful. And maybe tell us a little bit about how that negative response impacted you. Um, if it's okay, we'll go to you first, Wendy, this time. And what would you share? Sure. Thank you. Um, so I was very involved with a retreat center, a Franciscan retreat center in a city in Wisconsin that was dear to my heart. And the associate director of that retreat center was a dear friend of mine, actually had been my spiritual director and was a dear friend. And we worked, we were colleagues. We ran retreats together, did lots of programs together. And I told him about the abuse after the other chain of events. And he was very supportive. Um, I trusted him. It, it, it felt like it was a safe place to, to share my story. And it was for a while. And then, um, one and he's a spiritual director so he has directees that come to him and he lives in the city where the priest who abused me was assigned for 20 years so there's a lot of people in that city who who knew of the abuser and one day he said to me you know there's not a day that goes by wendy that i don't have some directee coming in and talking about the horrible tragedy that has been bestowed upon father mark and i just want you to know it's a really heavy burden and something didn't feel right within me but I said I am so sorry <gasps> I'm so sorry I, I, I'm sorry like that's all I could say and that kind of was left for months and it just never felt right and then one day he had called me and he said what are you working on and I said well I'm considering a lawsuit against the diocese because the DOJ reported, they said that the diocese is going to be contacting you and da, 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 da. Well, no one contacted me and I left voice messages and emails and I called for months and I just kept getting ghosted from the diocese. Ignoring, ignoring, ignoring. So I told this friend, oh, flippantly considering a lawsuit against the diocese. And so we chatted about that. And then the next day he sent me a text and said, we need to talk. And I don't know about you, but I get scared when I get a text that says we need to talk. So I called him and he said, OK, we need to talk about this. He said, you are a front presenter. You are all over our fall brochure because I was doing a ton of programs for them. He said, if you report this, the public is going to connect the dots. You're the one who's suing the diocese. And you're the one on doing all these programs. And he said, I just want to say, people are going to make assumptions and decisions and you may not be welcome. I said, so wait, are you blacklisting me? And he said, that's not what I said. You just may not be welcome. And I was pissed, like sickeningly pissed. And I talked to some trusted friends about this. And like, God, do I keep working at this retreat center? Do I call him out on this? This just made me ill. So I texted him again months later and said, if I go public hmm, without it being connected to a lawsuit, am I still blacklisted? And he said, why do you keep dragging me into this? And I said, dude, I'm not the one dragging you and you dragged yourself. And when you told me I'd be blacklisted, he said, listen, if you want to remain friends with me, you can never, ever speak about this again. wow um that conversation happened i sat with it for months didn't talk about it didn't talk to him contact eventually contacted his boss drove a couple hours to have lunch with her had to tell of course have to tell the whole story of the starting from when i was 17 tell the whole thing she sat across from me she held my hands and she was bawling and she said wendy my only goal is to do no more she said, I'm sure HR is going to want to talk to you. I said, I'm not out to get him fired. I just want you to know. And I want to be able to work at this retreat center. I felt really heard and seen from her. And then, I don't know, four days later, I got an email that said, hmm, policy and procedures. Um, sorry, but we can't take a side. I never asked you to take a side. 
So basically she sided on his side. And then after that, I just cut ties with them. And that honestly, well, the injury from that, the personal pain of that whole experience is so great and so painful for me. And I still, I get their newsletters. I see his name all over the place. And I, I'd say a bad word right now, but I'm not going to say a bad word. Um, <laughs> Because we promised we wouldn't say bad words. So that, you know, there. so that was horrible. The other thing I just want to mention very, very briefly is I did have a meeting with the bishop and the bishop, the canon lawyer, the deacon, all, all these men I'm in a room with. And that experience with the, with the bishop was also an absolute shit show because he didn't have a clue as to what was going on. He, it was horrible. So that happened with the diocese as well. Didn't feel as personal as the spiritual director friend. Hmm. Wendy, I have to say, I've, I've heard you tell that story to me a few times and it makes me so angry every time, every time I hear it. And I'm so sorry for that personal betrayal on top of everything else you're going through. Um, but thank you for sharing that with us. I think it's helpful for people to hear and understand um, the way those those kind of behaviors can really wound people. So thank you for trusting us with that. Um, I'd love to go to you next, Gina, if you would be willing to share a little bit about, I know you have your own kind of negative responses you've received as well. Yes, thanks, Sarah. Um, so a couple of points. One um, is when I initially came forward and met with uh, the archdiocese, they were completely ill-equipped to navigate my circumstance, um, in, incompetent and, and just ill-equipped. And, you know, up until that point, up until the point of my abuse, I, um, I like to describe myself as the Pope John Paul II generation. I saw the world through rose-colored glasses or the you know, through rose colored glasses and um, was utterly devastated and scandalized by the response I was getting from the church because I just had never experienced anything like that. And I didn't know anyone who had experienced anything um, like what I was going through. Um, one of the things that was very important to me as a devout Catholic. I mean, just, you know, we talked about it, like I, I was coming out of the con, I had come out of the convent. So clearly my faith was very, very important to me, just like everyone here, mo you know, most everyone here were at different places, but at that time was so important to me. And all I could think about was this fear that I was going to hell. I was terrorized by this fear, this paralyzing fear that I was going to go to hell because I had stopped going to mass. I couldn't step foot into a Catholic church. I was terrified. And so I wrote to the archbishop and I explained my story, even though it wasn't a priest from our diocese, he was my bishop. And so I wrote a letter to him and all I longed for was for him to say that I wasn't going to go to hell. And what I got was a voicemail from him saying that he had shred my letter. I cannot describe the devastation that I felt in my heart that he shredded my letter. And just to give you a little background, I knew um, from working in the church, previously I had worked in the church, I knew that the bishops get a lot of angry letters. I had made it my life's one of my life's missions that once or twice a year, but at least once a year, I would write him a letter thanking him for all the good that he was doing for the church. And then that was the response I got. And I was so, I was just so angry. I was just so angry and devastated. Um, and then I'll, I'll quickly mention, um, and I, I just, because of time, I don't have the time to go into this into detail, but I did go public with my story in 2019. And when I did that, I remember waking up, getting the text message that said, your story is live. I literally jumped out of bed and in my room, I 
high five to Jesus. And I was like, we did it. We did it. And I was so excited. And I was so proud of the fact that like, yes, we have overcome this darkness. We've brought it into the light. Like I have come so far from 2007. It's to this place where I have no shame. I can just say, yep, this happened. This is a part of my journey. And let's just keep moving forward. And within 24 hours, my world was in total chaos because the response that I got from some of the people closest to me that I did not expect was absolutely horrible and devastating. And it resulted in, um, similar to Wendy, uh, it resulted in, for me, losing the parish in which I had been baptized, received all of my sacraments and had gone to my entire life, except the time that I was in the convent. And I no longer feel welcome there. And that loss is so gigantic. I have not yet been able to find a parish that I've registered at that I feel like I can call home um, because that's my home. And I lost my spiritual home. And that's been very, very painful for me. It's one of those events, you know, we call it secondary trauma. Um, and that's been really painful. So, Thank you for sharing that, Gina. I just, I feel so deeply that that loss and sense of betrayal that you're trying to, that you're communicating about um, believing and, and hoping for a better response and expecting a better response from the church and then also from those close to you and then not receiving that and how how hard and how painful that is. So thank you for sharing that with us here today. Uh, Vince, we'll turn to you. I know you have a unique story about another um, circumstance, another uh, telling of your story that did not go well. And you're muted right now, Vince. Thanks. After uh, several years of intensive therapy with finally after finding a, an excellent psychologist, I uh, got to the point where I, I felt that I wanted that it was important for my healing process to, to meet with and confront my perpetrator. And after some uh, arrangements that were made um, with the um, order that he belonged to, uh, uh, they agreed to set up a, a meeting. And uh, in retrospect, I wish that I had been much better prepared for this meeting, but going into it, my, my hope was that regardless of, of his response, um, I felt that it was important for me to at least do my best to let him know uh, what I had experienced and what I um, had felt and, and how it had affected not only my life, but my family's life, uh, and the other secondary victims involved. So the meeting was set up at uh, one of the retreat centers that the order had. Uh, it uh, was uh, uh, attended by the uh, vice provincial of the order. Um, and uh, 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 on on their territory, on their turf. So um, I recall going in and um, uh, getting ready for the meeting and this, uh, my perpetrator uh, came running out uh, of his room down the hall and with open arms, you know, wanting to, to give me a hug and say, Vince, Vince. And and my initial reflex was, as when I was a kid, to hug him back. Um, he looked terrible. He looked uh, uh, worn, depressed. He looked, uh, I mean, he certainly aged many years and uh, had not been caring for himself. And so part of me started to feel some pity for him, actually, or I felt sorry for him. So, um and then, so at that point, the, the vice provincial happened to, who, who was a psychologist, happened to walk out and said, yelled at Mark, at this person and said, you know, back away, don't, don't, you know, don't connect. And which was obviously the right thing. But so from that moment, I, I, I 
experienced a lot of, again, conflicting mixed feelings, um, much like what I had experienced earlier. I mean, there was a part of me that felt uh, that this was somebody who loved me. Uh, I felt it was somebody who truly cared about me, somebody who um, I could trust with not only my physical being, but my soul. And um, that um, I, I also, uh, you know, had had some feelings of unreasonable guilt because um, part of me felt complicit in the abuse that took place because he, um, because he, you know, he was a very charismatic uh, guy, a lot of energy, a lot of guys looked up to him and uh, well regarded for the most part. And, um, you know, so I, 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 a part of me really liked that attention that I was receiving, even though a lot of it was abuse, but um so we went into the room next to the chapel and uh, there at the retreat center and uh, it was even set up where he was sitting at least six inches higher in a chair across from me and the vice his boss the vice provincial was sitting to his right and uh and he was very charming uh again making it difficult to you know, you know, ex express at first my my anger about what had occurred. And uh, as I continue to go forward and, and, and tell him my of my experience, what I had uh, recalled and some of my feelings, he was in total denial, just total denial of anything that ever happened. The, the, the closest he got to anything was at the end where he said, "Well, if if anything happened, I, I you know, I, I I I guess I'm sorry for that, but um, and and uh, you know, I don't know if it was because of some cognitive difficulties he was having, um, or you know, just the fact that he was a you know had a serious personality disorder, you know, a sociopath who was never going to admit to anybody's to to any of the things that he did." So uh, one of the things that helped me kind of ground myself in the middle of all that was to think, okay, so right now I'm not feeling like I want to, you know, knock this guy's block off, but uh, not that I intended to do that, but I, I, I thought about what, what if this had occurred to my, to my daughter, you know, and immediately, you know, just, I would, I, nothing would have held me. Would have held me from from destroying them and so it became clear again that you know a lot of that was from my own feelings about it about him so anyway um you know moving away from that for a while i mean i i, I was struggling again with some mixed feelings and some flashbacks and some uh, connection dissociation um but it, it it was at least i can feel that i i know that i gave him the information I wanted to 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 talk to him about and where I came from, whether he accepted it or not, that's that's another separate issue. But um, in retrospect, I wish I had been better prepared. I think I don't know how prepared I could have been, but wow, yeah, that it sounds like a really intense and also disappointing experience. And thank you for sharing the complexity of your feelings in that. I think a lot of survivors listening can understand that um, that still feeling of somehow connected and the mixed emotions that come with that. And so thank you for, for sharing those details with us, Vince. I'm aware that there are a lot of people that are here in the audience today because they are thinking about how they could be helpful and do the right thing in contrast to many of these responses that you're sharing that were not helpful. So I'm wondering if we can now turn to maybe you sharing a little bit about if there are, is someone else who has been helpful in their response to you? Um, can you tell us a little bit about a time when someone 
said or did something right in response to your abuse. And uh, maybe we'll go first to you, Gina, with that. Sure. Thank you again, Sarah. Uh, I want to preface my answer by saying, one, I certainly do not speak for all survivors. I also know that my experience falls into the category of rare uh, in what I'm about to share. And so I, I just want to acknowledge that. And I want to acknowledge all of the victim survivors out there who have had horrible, horrible experiences with leadership in the church. And I, I want to acknowledge that and state that right off the top. But I also want to share my experience because I think it's important to share. In 2013, um, like I had mentioned, I had not been practicing my faith. Um, it was very difficult for me. I had the desire to do so, um, but just was not able to cross that threshold. I had some experiences privately in prayer where those doors started opening up in my heart. And one step that I took was I started listening in little bits, as much as I could tolerate, little bits of Catholic radio. And one day I was driving in my car, I'm a hospice nurse, and in between patients, I was listening to Catholic radio and I caught the tail end of the ordination of a bishop. And he spoke at the end of his ordination. To this day, I don't know what he said. I don't remember it. All I remember was I said to myself, if anyone can help me, it's him. So I sent an email. And I asked if I could meet with him one time. And that was all I thought was going to happen, that I'd meet with him one time. I don't know why I even gave him a chance, given my history with leadership in the church, but I just had this sense. So we met once um, and I immediately knew he cared and I could visibly see within his demeanor and his response that this disturbed him greatly. Uh, and so what I thought was going to be a one-time meeting has ended up to be now um, 10 and a half years. January will be 11 years, 10 and a half years of him meeting with me monthly, religiously, every, once a month. And again, I want to fully acknowledge, I know this is not common. He has helped me. I am so eternally, eternally grateful because he has really helped me restore trust, not so much in him, but trust in the Lord. And that's what's been, that was what was so devastating to me was Jesus was my everything. And in dealing with the abuse that happened when I was a child, yep. Jesus was the, my grounding in the healing. And when I was trying to heal from this clergy abuse, I didn't have any grounding because I, I couldn't cling to Jesus. And I knew for me that that was, that was where I was ultimately going, going to find healing. And I couldn't, I couldn't get there. Um, and this Bishop has very patiently and gently walked with me. And one of the things um, I shared earlier this week with some of the people on here, um, and I'm going to I'm going to tone it down because now that I'm actually on this and it's being recorded, I'm nervous to use the actual words. But um, I remember one day sitting with this bishop, looking him in the eye, and I was so full of rage. And I just said, I hate the effing Catholic Church. And I was so livid. And he didn't even flinch. And he said, I understand. And more importantly, Jesus understands. And I remember my heart just collapsing and I, I cried and cried and cried and cried. I just bawled my eyes out because I knew that he got it. I knew he understood. And to think, yeah, Jesus understands my rage. And no one had ever told me that before. I had never even thought about it. And I was scared to be full of rage. And I was certainly scared to be full of rage before God and I was terrified to admit that I hated the church, at least in that moment, I hated the church. And that has ebbed and flowed. And some days I hate the church and some days I love the church. And some, most days I'm somewhere in the middle. Um, and he's allowed me the freedom 
to be in whatever space I'm at. And that has been a pure gift to me. And I'm very grateful. Well, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that experience and also the sensitivity that you offered. And we know that many people do not have that opportunity to have that kind of positive experience with a church leader, but it's also really, it gives me hope to, to hear that, that that is what you've experienced. So thank you for that. I think we'll go to you next, Vince. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about someone who has been helpful to you and what they have said and done that has felt right? Oh, you're muted again, Vince. Sorry. <laughs> my family, um, particularly my mom, my dear mom, who passed away uh, earlier this uh, this year, 95 years of age. And um, when she learned of this, I mean, she was just so angry at uh, the perpetrator as, you know, she also felt very betrayed that he had tried to befriend her and... Um, and that, uh, you know, she could begin to understand some of the difficulties, I think, or challenges I was seeing. And um, for a while, we um, had some support uh, group meetings uh, on occasions uh, that were led by one of the psychologists who had been on the independent response team. And some of those uh, were uh, open to family members who wanted to attend and she was always there, even though she had to go hundreds of miles, she was there. And she was, you know, um, not only attentive, but she, I mean, not, she didn't hold back on how she felt. And um, the thing that bothered me the most about mom is, is that she always blamed herself for the abuse. She, she felt responsible for allowing me as a 14-year-old kid to to move out of the house and and live away uh, at that very young age and to be exposed to that that trauma, and I think she took that to her grave. You know, um, she was always a, a, a devout Catholic um, uh, to the end, um, but uh, this was, I think, uh, very traumatic for her. Uh, my siblings, uh, particularly my sister, uh, she, she, you know, she's a few years younger, um, and she still is very uh, supportive. You know, we talk from time to time. She'll check in on me. She'll ask how things are going, and and she's just been very loving and very caring, and that just you know goes a long ways. Um, that acceptance, that validation, and uh, um, so I've been very fortunate that way. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you. And how about you, Wendy? Uh, what would you share about a helpful experience? Yeah, yeah. Just a little tiny bit of background. Um, when this whole thing went public, not not my name went public, but the case went public and the priest was removed, the statement he made was an admittance that this happened. Then he, you know, he got removed from ministry and then a lawyer got involved and he denied everything and backpedaled and changed his story. So there had to be a private investigator. I had to go before the review board. The review board was hung, couldn't make a decision. So the whole thing goes to Rome. Rome comes back with a decision that um, in 1983, when the abuse happened, the age of majority was 15 meaning the age of consent was 15 for a girl and I was 17. So they closed the case and it came back to the bishop and um, the priest lawyer said, okay, we're good to go. Put him right back into ministry. This is all clean slate. He is, he is fine. He is in great standing back to Monsignor. And the priest said, well, that doesn't seem okay which is kind of a shocking response. And because of that, the bishop, the one who I said, I was in a meeting with him where it was a shit show, the bishop and the vicar and just I met to talk about what, what should be the punishment, the consequences. And they, they just asked me, what do I want? And I said, he can't do this. He can't do this. He can't be here. He can't say this. He can't. I had a list of things 
that I did not think would be okay. Because when a priest's name doesn't go on the list, because um, that's what we we're kind of after, you know, it's like, oh, he was the victim. And so I explained to the bishop and the victim, I said, you don't understand. The public thinks he's the one who has wrongdoing done to him. They heard me and I was bawling my eyes out in this little conference room with the bishop and the vicar and they cried with me. I mean, they believed me. They understood the pain. The bishop said that it's been the hardest decision of his whole career and he feels pain for me. He feels pain for the priest and they granted every single one of my requests. Everyone. And the priest agreed to them all with no questions asked. So it, it was just really a change, you know, a flip of how it first was to how it ended up. And, and again, I don't know that that's everybody's experience. That's mine. There was a lot of healing that happened for me. I still feel like there's closure that needs to happen. I, I would like the, the chance that Vince had, I would like the chance to meet with the priest and get a face-to-face -face apology. Um, but yeah, the, the bishop and the vicar and the priest actually, the, ab the abuser had some pretty remarkable reactions. Wow. Wow. Um, I'm grateful, especially hearing that it, it didn't start that way, that you were able to get a better response over time. And I hear how I've heard in a couple of people's stories like that showing of that this story impacts them, right? That they showed emotion, they cried with you, um, how powerful that was to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So thank you for sharing that. Um, in a moment, we're going to uh, go to audience questions. So if anyone has a question for our panelists, obviously we're not going to be asking them to share more specific details of their stories than they have already chosen to share here, but kind of advice or uh, what you would like to know from them um, about how to how to do better. But I, I think we'll start by asking you that directly. And I think we'll go to you first, Vince, is just thinking about, you know, the people in our audience, what, especially those who are listening to this thinking, I, I want to do a good job listening to people of experienced abuse. I would, I would like to be helpful, not harmful. What advice would you give to people, Vince? On mute. Uh, I, I guess one of the first things is to recognize that many uh, victim survivors are willing and, and want to tell their story to, you know, somebody who will be helpful. Um, and because I think sometimes we shy away from wanting, oh, should I bring it up or not? It might just create more problems. But, you know, I really believe that storytelling is all in the story. And I think a lot of the narrative work, you know, can be so healing um every time we do that and so do recognize that you know it's okay to ask you know would would you care to share your story and get the permission and then and then allow the person to to speak and and just just be a generous listener you know just to be be present listen understand um i think uh validate, believe them non-judgmentally um, and and um, uh, you know let 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 them know that obviously that um, you know you, this will be held in confidence, but I wanted to say also to to the being present, I think I think a lot of times, we feel like we have to fix it. Well, don't feel like you have to fix it, you know, and, you know, by just listening genuinely uh, and, and asking questions as appropriate, um, I think does much, much more, uh, is much, much more uh, beneficial. Um, so that, that's what I would suggest. Thank you. Thanks, Vince. Uh, how about you, Wendy? What would you, what would your advice be? Yeah, very similar to Vince, and I'm going to add one thing, but but having really, really big ears and a really, really small mouth, 
would, would be a great piece of advice if someone's telling you their story. Um, listen, and I love what he said, generous listener. Um, the other is a very practical piece of advice, but I have found it to be incredibly helpful that when I have shared my story with friends or family members, yeah, like members. a few <laughs> folks have reached out like the next day or a couple days later, just acknowledging how vulnerable that was for me and thanking me for my honesty and, and just, you know, a few words of gratitude. You know, I, I, I don't know, for me, that did something of, of carrying it on. It's not like blah, 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 I did all this and then they just go away and I don't hear from them or we don't address it again. So a text, to call, some sort of communication shortly after. Thanks, Wendy. Yeah, that's a really important point. And I have something I've heard from many, many survivors is that feeling of after telling the story to someone continue to, to think about you and, and reach out. And so thanks. How about you, Gina? What uh, would you, what advice would you give? Again, I piggyback on the brilliant answers of uh, Wendy and Vince listening uh, and, and not being afraid of silence and acknowledging and affirming, you know, just statements like, thank you for your courage. I'm so sorry this happened to you. And to acknowledge that you're angry. I think one of the most frustrating things for me at times is I would share what happened to me and I couldn't tell if the other person was angry about it or not. And I just wanted them to be mad with me. Like, be mad at what happened to me, you know, um, and to to acknowledge that, especially if the victim is expressing anger to say, I'm angry too. That feels really good inside to hear that. Um, and then to piggyback too on what on what Wendy said is even to, to say, look, if tomorrow or the next day you're feeling uneasy about what you shared with me, know that I'm holding this in confidence, but reach out Feel free to reach out if you need encouragement or reassurance that it was okay that you shared your story with me. Because um, then you're giving power to that person too. You're empowering them. Um, I just want to see, I wrote some notes. Just lastly, just a practical piece of advice for uh, any victims of, of abuse. If you're with someone who's the victim of abuse, no matter what type, to just ask permission I think a natural reaction is to want to touch someone who's crying or upset, but to ask permission. Can I give you a hug? Can I put my hand on your shoulder? Can I hold your hand? Uh, some people don't want to be touched. Others would love for you to hold them, but to ask permission. Yeah, that's great. Thank you all so much for the just very practical advice uh, too. That's I think really helpful. So we have a little bit of time here for questions from the audience. And so um, I'm just looking over our list here and I'm, you know, I don't think we're gonna be able to get to all of them, but uh, we had a couple questions related to basically like early on in, in coming forward with your story, what did you hope for? Like, what was your wish or your goal when you were speaking up coming forward and did you, did you receive what you needed, um, what you were wishing or hoping for? So um, is there one of you that would be, I know you you haven't had time to think about these questions, so I don't want to put you on the spot, but is there one of you that would be interested in responding to that question of what you were hoping for? Uh, it looks like, go ahead, Wend uh, all of you are, all right. So Wendy and then Gina and Vince, and we'll do these ones a little briefly so we can get to more audience questions. Yeah, I think I was just looking to get it off my chest. I, I had held that secret for so long. My my only goal was to tell somebody that I could trust. That was it. How about you, Gina? Get him out of ministry. Get help for the people that he that he also hurt because we knew that there were others. He had actually admitted that there were others. So the 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 beauty was he was removed from ministry. The part that was upsetting to me, which eventually was part of my motivation in going public was that his community refused to make it public. And so it put the onus on me. That was not my driving force because I didn't think that was healthy for me, but I eventually felt like I was supposed to go public. 
Um, and part of the gift of that was that it did expose him so that the people he hurt could get help. That was part of um, my reasoning for wanting to go public. Hmm. Thanks. And how about you, Vince? I, I believe I, I found it important to be heard. I wanted to be heard. I wanted to be seen. I wanted to be um, understood as a as as a human being who had been through this process and uh, validated. Um, briefly, uh, when I've mentioned this recently to a uh, Catholic uh, priest, um, his response was little to. I had mentioned to him in 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 uh, that that I had been a Bruin at UCLA for eight years, and he, uh, he his his response was "Go Bruins." I said, "What the you know?" But I went and I spoke with another uh, uh, priest of another denomination, and he said, "Stop." He paused. He said that, and he validated just by saying that you know I, I really appreciate you taking that that risk and talking about it and I hear you and I want to be able to 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 validate that and I want to be able to tell you that I'm here to you know be of some help but uh, um, that was so moving so meaningful so so healing I think hmm. thank you so we have uh, another question um, from someone who is, I think, you know, has their own experience that they are, you know, carrying and is asking, what would your advice would be to someone who is, who would think is thinking about speaking up about what happened in order to, um, in, in this person's case, uh, they're saying to find closure, but if they're not sure about doing that because they're afraid of just getting a disappointing answer or response. So do you have any advice in um, for that kind of situation? For me, I would think about finding a, a, a therapist who truly was experienced uh, uh, and uh, had expertise and uh, compassionate um uh to work with to begin to to help i think sort through your own narrative and your own story and and to clarify you know and validate and uh support you um for me that was that was most valuable it took a while to find the right therapist i went through several but i finally i think with the help of the spirit found a nice Jewish psychologist who was able to actively work with me and, and uh, help me rebuild some uh, healthy boundaries. So I think for me, that would be one thing to consider. Hmm. Yeah, I thanks. Would, I would say the same thing of a therapist. That's where I started. And the word closure, that's a tricky word for a victim survivor because I, I, I don't know if that's ever going to happen for me. What I don't even know what that means really, but just to process it. I do have a great therapist and I have a spiritual director, a, a really good spiritual director as well. I agree about therapy. Um, and I also agree with Wendy about, about closure. You know, um, I had someone say to me once, like, is there ever going to be a time you're going to get over this and not talk about it so much? Um, the truth is I talk about it a lot less than I used to, but I remember being so offended. Like, no, this is a, a deep wound in my heart that is always going to be part of me. And there are going to be times where I can think of nothing else and can only talk about this. And there'll be times where I won't think about it for weeks. Um, the other is that I would suggest, and I don't mean this don't know exactly how to word it because I, 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 I want to be a positive influence, but to lower your expectations um, and to, to know if your heart is in the right place, to start with your therapist. If your heart's in the right th place and you know you're doing what's best for you, that's, that's the gift, that it's a gift for yourself and not for someone else or expecting change. And I feel like a hypocrite saying that because I have not navigated that well. Like I think, well, I went to the, the community and they should have done this and they didn't. I went to the archdiocese and they should have done this and they didn't. And then getting so frustrated and angry about that. Um, 
but to to work with a therapist to try to be at a place where you're strong enough within yourself to say, if I don't get the response that I am looking for, I'm going to be okay. Mm. Wow, there's so much. I'm just like taking in all this hard won wisdom from all of you. So thank you for that. Uh, we have another question um, asked maybe to start with Vince. This person is asking, but um, wondering about what what the reasons were um, that you held on to your story and didn't share it for so long. And this person is asking, you know, for you, was it was it shame or was it denial? And and I guess there's kind of this broader question of are there things that those around you could have done um, or any of us could have done, you know, for someone else uh, to make you feel safe enough to share earlier? Or do you think it just needed to take this long till you were ready? And I'd love to, they, they asked you, Vince, specifically. I'd also, Wendy, I know you have a similar kind of journey there. So yeah, talk a little bit about the time. I, I think a lot of it had to do with that this was such a a gradual process. I initially went to this priest because I was feeling homesick during the first month of being away from home for the first time. And he had uh, introduced himself to my family and I when they first dropped me off at the seminary. And he said, hey, don't worry. You know, I'll keep an eye on this guy. You know, I'll take care of him. Because my mom was saying, you know, is he going to be taken care of? And so, uh, and he was Latino. And so he felt like, looked like, sounded like family, you know, and then he, you know, uh, like I said earlier, became like family to, to, uh, to the folks. My grandmother, who had a ranch in Mexico at the time, actually even built a little chapel just for him to come and say mass. She had some workers on um uh, on the ranch and I remember we went down during summer one time and uh, we uh, celebrated the, the first communion of one of the children there and this person was there and so and um, so he infiltrated I would say the family just so deeply um, I, I, a part of me just didn't want to blow it I, I don't know it was weird um, you know, I wanted to continue to respect him. I saw how much they respected him. I didn't want to blow their fantasy or their ideas about it. Um, and uh, like I said, a part of me felt complicit. I felt like, you know, I I really like this this attention. And uh, even though sometimes it was, you know, uh, on the surface, you know, I was made a fool of in, in, in class for whatever reason. I mean, he used to call me frog face. I mean, you know, what the heck, but he, he you know, he, uh, um, even that, I, and I think part of it was because I was a vulnerable young kid who was a little homesick and, uh, in a new environment right. of way. Um, you know, I, I really, a part of me really grasped onto that. And so, I, it was difficult to let go of that fantasy for a long time. I hadn't dealt with the reality of that. A part of me was in denial from that. Part of me was, you know, seeing him as a part of my family. Um, like I said, even to the point of having him perform the, as a main celebrant at, at, at my wedding, and it was con celebrated, and he was in the middle of all this, you know, I mean, so it was a big deal. And so, um, I hope that kind of answers it. Um, yeah, thank you. And just recognizing that it's a complex and I think it's something that a lot of people want to better understand why sometimes it takes such a long time. Wendy, would you want to um, share anything on that too? Sure, it's very similar to Vince. Um, the priest after the abuse ended, he was my spiritual director. He knew my husband. He was involved in our wedding. He knew some of our kids. And he was the golden child in the diocese, the Monsignor. And so I, too, felt this. Well, I denied it for 40 years. I told myself that I wasn't abused. Okay, maybe I was. But I mean, it was so confusing for me. And knowing 
what would happen if I came forward with this story? What would happen to him? What would he think of me? How many other people will hate me? That's why I'm, I haven't really gone public with my story. My name is protected. Um, and the guilt, you know, the guilt and the shame. I mean, I was 17. I should have known better. How did I let this all happen? I, all of that complex. Hmm. That helps. That yeah. would be, that would be why. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for sharing all of that. Uh, we have time for, I think, one more question here. And someone uh, in the audience is um, who I, you know, is identifying again, their own experience and saying, one problem I've faced is countering the perception that people think I'm trying to harm the church by telling my story. Um, how can we convey that we're not wanting to hurt the church by coming forward? Uh, Gina, is that something you'd be comfortable starting with? I am very passionate about this, uh, because, um, again, knowing that we are all in different places, that there are victim survivors out there who will never step foot into a Catholic church for the rest of their lives. And that is okay. And I understand that for me, um, my faith was something that I really wanted to restore, um, and it has taken time and it's still a very bumpy road. I really wrestled with, if I share my story, am I going to turn people away from the church? I have, I'm an, I have an evangelistic heart. I want to bring people to the church, not away from the church. And so if I share my story, am I going to be leading people away from the church or people who might be curious about the church? Am I just going to feed what they already think about the church and that it's just full of pedophiles? And, and am I going to make that all worse? And I had to come to the realization that I did not create this. I did not cause this. By me speaking the truth, only good can come from the truth. And the truth needs to be exposed. My abuser will lead people away from the church, not me. This is not my, my burden to carry. And if my path to greater freedom, right, it's all about what's best for me. If my path to greater freedom is exposing the truth and sharing the truth privately or publicly, then that's the path that I need to take so that I can heal and be restored. He doesn't get to rob me of that. That's not that's just not okay. And it's not fair. And if it leads people away from the church, then they've got other, other things that they may be wrestling with. And that's between them and God and not something that I need to take responsibility for and won't take responsibility for. And one of the gifts, actually, this Bishop that I shared with, that's been meeting with me monthly. One of the reasons I trust him is because I was in a, I am in a diocese where everything blew up. And I'll never forget the day he said to me, this all needs to be in the media. To hear a bishop say that, he said, it has to be exposed. It's like a wound. A wound can't heal unless we expose the wound, get to the bottom of it and heal from the inside out. These wounds need to be exposed so that we can heal. And that's the healthy response. There's no room for fear. I see Wendy applauding you there. And um, Vince, do you want to add something briefly? Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I think that um, places uh, like Awake and others, I think, are, are, are invaluable in helping to educate uh, more and more of us, more and more of the, the, the people uh, about you know what this is about, and hopefully that will be a you know one one resource that can help to reduce some of these these feelings like well oh, they're going to think I'm just out for the money or I'm out for to harm the church. Um, I I I, I uh, so I I think education is going to certainly be be more and more important. Um, I the other thing is is I I. I feel that if I continue to have toxic silence and not say what is actually going on, that's very harmful to me and to those around me. And I feel that it's my responsibility to 
to be more active with that and not you know become more mindful and aware when that happens because if we allow that those ideas to continue or the church leaders to say nah you know this person is you know unbelievable we don't you know is not you know that that just reabuse more trauma for for the individual and for others so i think for me i see it as 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 part of my responsibility to to recognize that in myself, that toxic silence, um, and to to be active with that. Hmm. Thanks, Vince. And I, I think that's such a a great way to end here is, you know, really this conversation today is part of our effort, Awake's effort, with along with all of you to end that toxic silence and to be to speak about what has happened so that there can be healing. So I thank you all. Uh so much for everything that you have shared today, Gina, Wendy, Vince. I'm so grateful to each one of you. We are going to hand things over to Tim for some closing announcements. And then we're going to come back to you one more time at the end for like one quick closing thought. So uh, I'll hand things over to Tim and then we'll hear back from you in just a few more minutes. And uh, go ahead, take it from here, Tim. Yeah, thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you for your role in shepherding this conversation. Um, my name is Tim Ellinger. I'm a volunteer here with Courageous Conversations planning team. And one of the intentions of Courageous Conversations that are important one is to deepen our understanding of the complexities that contribute to and emerge from the abuse in the church. And I, I want to specifically acknowledge the strength and the courage needed for our panelists to be here, to embrace the power and the wisdom that your stories have to promote that understanding and transformation. As Sarah said, you'll be coming back in just a minute to share some closing thoughts, but, but first some announcements. Um, first, that our next Courageous Conversation will be taking place on Thursday, November 14th, uh, November 14th at noon central time. Uh, the details will be coming out soon, so please watch for more and register when that time comes. Uh, next month, Awake will be, the Awake community uh, will be gathering for a virtual prayer service centered around Awake's patron saints. Uh, this gathering will be on Zoom on Wednesday, October 23rd from 7 to 8 p.m. Central. You can sign up for this virtual prayer service on the Awake website. More immediately, watch for a feedback survey coming to you today that includes registration for part two of this courageous conversation that will happen next Thursday, September 19th. It will happen in the evening at 7 p.m. Central. Uh, this will be uh, the, the, the typical small group format that we'll have for sharing um, what we've heard and, and what we feel and what we think uh, going forward from today's conversation. And please, uh, we encourage you to share the recording of today's conversation with friends and colleagues to continue to expand this conversation, um, uh, uh, grow and cultivate the community on this issue. That uh, recording will be out in the next day or two. So I want to come back to the panelists again and thank you for being here. And as, as Sarah said, this is a chance for you to briefly share just one takeaway that you would like each of us or us to, to take with us today to remember from listening to your story. So Gina, would you mind going first? Sure. Thank you, Tim. The main takeaway for today that I think is important is that um, to all victim survivors, your voice is important and needs to be heard. And for those of you who work with or minister to victims of survivors, survivors, uh, victim survivors of abuse, um, I just want to say thank you for being present and making yourself available to be that set of listening ears and to accompany survivors on the journey because that accompaniment is not for the faint of heart. And it's a long, difficult journey. And for those of you who have stuck beside someone who has struggled with abuse, I just want to say thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all who have walked with me. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Well, well, well said. Vince, could you give us something to well, take with us? Sure. Um, well, I'd just like to say that in in my journey, I've come to appreciate 
how the Holy Spirit has really been with me. She never gave up. Um, you know, I even in the darkest of moments and times, I mean, I still said a very simple but powerful prayer, come Holy Spirit. And, you know, I, I can see moments where I think some of the some some of the 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 movement of the spirit was there and helped me get through. And at this point in time, I I, I have appreciated how much void spiritual void has been in my life. And I think having uh, an opportunity now to work on developing that further, partly by you know discernment and and prayer to say that. You know, I needed to give up the, the fantasy of, of saving the Catholic Church um, and that I wasn't going to find, um, I think, a, a, a healthy place for me there. Um, and so I, I have transitioned to another faith a group, the Episcopal Church, and have found just such a welcoming, healthier, open environment that I think has encouraged me to think and not to just have to take orders from the above about how I'm supposed to think and to be able to grow in my joyful worship and to begin to do more spiritual healing. And I'm, you know, um, in a two year program to become a spiritual director so that I can walk and companion other, hopefully other uh, victim survivors of clerical abuse. So, um, hope. There's hope and prayer. Thank you, Vince. Powerful words. Uh, toxic silence will not fill that spiritual void. Um, Wendy, you bring it home for us here. Final words. Sure. Um, echoing what Vince just said about it's not my job to save the church. Um, I really love that. My job is to save myself, and that's what I'm working on. Um, as you've heard today, you had three survivors and one survivor story is just that, one survivor story. And anybody on this call who is a victim survivor, your story is unique. Something, and it's really because of being involved in Awake, something that I have come to understand through the retreats, the prayer services, anything I've been involved in. And I heard this somewhere else, but it rings true of, um, we're all the same, we just suffer differently. And I think that's how this shows up. We're just all the same, but our suffering shows up differently. So thank you, all of you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for those beautiful, wise words, Wendy. So as we close, uh, the leadership and, and many of us volunteers for Awake are motivated by our faith to do this work. And when we gather, we pray together. So we're going to end today with a short prayer. And we invite anyone who wishes to stay on to join in this prayer to please do so. That said, we know that there are many, many good reasons, uh, as as some have been said here today, that some of us may not choose to stay to be part of this prayer. And if you'd like to sign off now, please know that we wish you peace and goodness, and that we hope to see you again soon. Join in any of our future activities with Awake. Now, as we begin our closing prayer, let us be reminded that, as always, we are in the presence of God who is love, God who is our mother, our father, our sister, our brother, our redeemer, in spirit. And feeling that presence now, we collect ourselves knowing that being here to listen is an act of love. We are being God for each other. Thank you, loving God, for bringing us together this afternoon, giving us the sacred gift of listening to witness and the wisdom that we have heard today. May we hold each other in our hearts, each of us doing our part to cultivate love to bring hope and healing that leaves no one out, no one behind, as we continue our journey to build 
this beloved community here on earth. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for joining us today. Go in peace, be well, take care. Goodbye.